Welcome to Fortigard Live. I'm Amara Lakani, and I have with me my good friend and fellow researcher, Jonas Walker. Jonas, how are you doing? Hey, Amar, doing great again here in, uh, in Singapore. It's, uh, it's midnight and it's one of these days again where no matter what time we, we hang out together, we have a lot of fun. And uh, today we have a, another interesting discussion. Yeah, absolutely. You know, today what I really wanted to talk to you about is, you know, we've seen over the last couple of months attacks on everything, you, you know, phishing attacks, OT attacks, attacks on critical infrastructure. And there's all these types of attacks and everyone's always asking me, hey, what do I really need to do to protect myself? And I start thinking, well, what are the what are the most major ways these attacks happen? And I know me and you were talking and we, you know, we, we know that sometimes that passwords are used over and over again. And people just don't change their passwords. They don't use unique passwords. And I think it's been a continuous problem that I've seen. And I think you've seen as well. Yeah, I think everyone who listens in, if we are very honest to ourselves, are we really sure we don't reuse one password for a different kind of applications? Because that's something which I have been doing many, many years ago. And even now, these days, I come up across old accounts where I realize, oh, this is one of my old passwords. And if I talk with my friends here and there, also family members, unfortunately, very often, still a lot of passwords are reused, similar passwords. Maybe the pattern is a little bit different, but they're not really random. They're not really unique. And in my opinion, it is a big problem because we have a lot of these data breaches happening. And reusable passwords is something which is quite easy for attackers to abuse since they don't need to hack any security layers. They can just use the credentials to log in into these systems. Yeah, so let's not forget, there's hundreds of millions of passwords that have been leaked. And sometimes they're like, you know, very, very old uh, passwords, very old leaks. But these passwords are being used over and over again by people on new sites. And sometimes they change a number, maybe they change, like add something to it or take away something for it. Maybe they substitute a zero with an O. But there's like actually common, common patterns. And there are programs out there. There's actually uh, very common programs that, and tools that attackers use that actually like look for these common substitutions and then add them or just like create new password lists and like i said from those hundreds of millions of passwords they can generate like millions of more new passwords with combinations and then just try them automatically it's not like they're typing those passwords in one at a time they're actually just writing scripts that are trying those passwords automatically on a lot of different sites yeah especially when we look for example at our keyboard layout it depends a lot what kind of keyboard layout you're using, because very often if a password, if a website asks for a password with a special character or a number, probably the special character is an exclamation mark because it's the one which is the top of the one. And using these patterns is not something which only we know about. It's about attackers have a lot of access to these data breaches from the past, and they can use technology to cor correlate these kind of data and passwords to figure out what kind of structures are they using, and then brute force these, uh, these guessable passwords much easier than unique passwords, for example. Okay, so we've been talking about like trying to use unique passwords. Uh, the other thing that I always tell people and encourage people to do is use unique usernames as well. Don't always use the same username. I know a lot of times you have to use an email address for a username, and you know you're kind of stuck there trying to create a new email address if you can. Um, but but, uh, but the other things you can do is you if the site allows you to do is create a unique username. Um, I do create unique uh, email addresses as well. So that way I can easily tell if a site is like actually selling my data or not, because if I start getting spam on that, I'm like, I only use it for one site. So it's just a, a personal thing, but just to back up, how do we do that? What, what, what recommendations would you give just the average uh, listener uh, or uh, watcher here on how to get unique passwords and hopefully unique usernames? So I'm, I'm a really big fan of password managers because it requires me to only remember one password, which is my master password. And these passwords manager, which uh, I'm not really affiliated at all, um, I can recommend that, uh, for example, one password or last pass, they make life very convenient because we need to remember our master password. And whenever we sign up to a different platform, they will automatically generate a new unique password for us and store it in our vault. And whenever we log into this website, we, all we need to do is use our master password to unlock our vault and use the password which is already saved. And this really helps us in case a data breach happens at a certain website that even though our password is known, 
it, it's not really a lot of value because no one can use this password for different kind of websites. I've seen this over and over again. And even though sometimes people use secure passwords, they have been hacked in the past. Um, maybe an older encryption was used. And this led to a couple of years forward, attackers using stronger computers to encrypt these hashes and then use these hashes a couple of years later. And even today, many, many people still reuse the same passwords as they did, for example, in 2012. So you make a good point here. Now, you, you know, password managers are a great tool. That's what I recommend as well. But I always tell people you should also protect that master password, that password manager, hopefully by two-factor or multi-factor authentication. And that's kind of a big deal these days is everyone talks about two-factor and multi-factor authentication. But I also think it gets, sometimes gives a false sense of security if you're not you know, doing it correctly. A lot of people will use multi-factor authentication with like text messages or SMS messages, like you put in your password and you get something text back. Um, that's pretty dangerous these days because there's a lot of attacks against like people taking over your phone number or cloning phone numbers uh, and basically stealing your text messages in, in a certain way. And I don't know if you've seen that uh, or uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I agree. Multi-factor is definitely something very important and it always comes down to something you have, something you know, something you are. And the more of these combinations you use, the better. I have seen, though, people using bad multi-factor authentication, for example, let's just say SMS, because even if we just use SMS, people are these days downloading too many apps on their phones. And if any, everyone takes their phone out and checks out the permissions, which they sometimes give to their apps, then we can see that these apps have the permission to check out, for example, SMS. And whenever someone uploads one of these apps to the to the Play Store or to the App Store and someone downloads it and gives them the permission to check their SMS, they can pretty much hijack these two-factor authentication codes whenever needed for, um, for getting access to these kind of uh, these um, logins. Yeah, so I'm I'm really I'm really happy these days. Most mobile phone operating systems, you know, give these little pop-ups. Are you sure you want to, you know, uh, share out SMS? Are you sure these are the permissions you want to give to the, these apps? But a lot of people are not really looking at them. They're just clicking yes, and a lot of times that's because the app makers have kind of trained us into doing that because the apps don't properly work without giving them pro without giving them all permissions now all the apps don't necessarily need all permissions but the you know app makers may want them for a variety of reasons you know for data mining for advertisements for other reasons as well and now you're relying on the security of that app vendor and of course there have been instances in the past where malicious apps have gone through they have stolen sms messages they've actually sent out sms messages through toll fraud basically that means you can, you know, an app will like send out an SMS message to some phone number that charges you for that SMS message. Um, there's been other types of attacks as well, where, you know, someone's like downloaded contact information and gotten a list of your address book, as well as all the fields in that address book, including someone's name, address, phone number, and even notes in some cases. So some people put in passwords or some sensitive information in the notes. That can be a bad thing. So I think, uh, you know, like looking at what you're doing on your phone, although the phone is, you know, the tax surface has been greatly reduced. Phone manufacturers are taking privacy much more seriously. Um, I think, you know, like downloading a lot of apps should be very, people should be careful on like where they're downloading apps from, obviously, and who's like man making those apps and what are they doing with that data? Like a lot, no, probably no one reads the big privacy policies, but they're actually doing something with that data. And what is that? And, you know, are you okay with that? Well, Omar, what would you recommend besides um, SMS, for example, for multi-factor authentication? What are your go-tos when, when you sign up on new websites? Yeah, so my go-to solution is, uh, you know, the authenticator apps. Uh, you know, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, one, ones made by Google, Microsoft, uh, um, you, you know, a lot of other manufacturers as well. Um, you know, the issue I think a lot of people worry about these authenticator apps is they're worried like what happens if they upgrade their phone or lose their phone. Uh, don't forget, you can actually have multiple authenticator apps. Uh, not only do I have one on my phone, I actually have like a phone that has no service that's just like, you know, just running in the background uh, that that's like I can plug in anytime I want and it's like my backup authenticator app. I also like physical authentication uh, devices and tokens uh, that are out there um, such as uh, Fortinet 40 token as well that you can integrate with 
with a lot of enterprise apps. Uh, of course, there's the YubiKey, which I'm a big fan of, uh, extremely popular device among security researchers. Um, that it's a physical token that incorporates that can be incorporated and integrated into a lot of applications. So there's a lot of tools I think consumers can just get out there as well as enterprises and kind of use the same techniques because these are the techniques that when we look, took, look at the big attacks that are being used to get these credentials. Of course, the other way people are getting credentials is phishing. And uh, that's that's a big thing me and you talk about all the time because phishing was a problem 10 years ago, it's a problem five years ago, and it's a problem absolutely today. And that's what attackers are using. Yeah, it's definitely one of the weakest links in, in any um, attack campaign. And I think, unfortunately, the story is not that different than it, it has been in the past. It's all, it's very often, it's via email, it's via SMS. And it's all about uh, for attackers coming up with a legitimate story, which might sound believable. And they usually pick a topic which has a big impact in, in the normal society, which is pushed by media. And then they leverage this thought with, uh, with emails targeting uh, targeting employees to, to get their credentials or ask them to execute some files which they are sending them over via email. Yeah, absolutely. So phishing attacks are always going to be around. They're always going to like take advantage of emotions. People always ask me like, hey, you know what? How can I how, how can I combat phishing attacks? I always say awareness, like training your users. Awareness is a big deal and that can really help. I do like some basic techniques. Like, for example, a lot of my clients, I recommend like using digital signatures. That usually kind of takes care of a lot of things. I usually recommend having two inboxes, one for like external email, one for internal email. So if you see someone external external, like, uh, like your CFO sending an email on the, that external box, you, you know, you know, that could be possibly a phishing attack that kind of raises awareness right away. There's like small techniques that I think you can do from an implementation standpoint, from a security enterprise standpoint to kind of take care of these attacks. But at the same time, I just think training and security awareness is such a big deal. Of course, we have the, our, our training site at training.fortinet.com that has a lot of security awareness training on it as well. I definitely agree with you, Amor. And also one thing to, to remember, when, when you get these emails with these attachments, which ask you to enable these macros, I don't really know any use case for a normal employee inside a corporate network where it was really required to enable macros in these office applications. So if you don't click on these buttons, it pretty much doesn't uh, allow the application to run the code in the back end. And we have seen attackers being more and more sophisticated, creating different kind of warning messages in the Word file itself to um, motivate people to click this enable button. But I don't know about you, Amar, but for me, I, I never really have seen a use case for non-technical people to really click on this uh, enable macro button. No, I think that's a great point and a great point to like close out with is like, you know, that awareness, I think kind of helps with that. Like don't ever click on that enable button. And if you know, if you, even if you think you have to click on that enable button, your, your document will work. Like actually find out about that. Maybe like talk to your IT department about that. But that's, I think, just another step in awareness. And uh, that's what we're trying to always do at Fortinet, at FortiGuard Live is to actually push awareness out and push out, you know, like common ways that people can be attacked and maybe common ways you can protect against those attacks. Um, it's always good talking to you, Jonas. Any any last words you want to add? Yeah, I have a, one more thing which which I want to highlight a little bit that uh, with now people going back more to the office these days, more and more people are vaccinated going back to the offices. I want to highlight that please keep in mind that during the last two years, we have seen a lot of attacks against home networks and a lot of devices which are inside these home networks have been breached. And bringing all these, bring your own devices now back to the corporate network needs to be um, very, very carefully handled. Because if, if you have if you have breached devices outside your network and now you bring them in as an internal employee, this can be very critical in the end. So please keep in mind that home networks have been heavenly under attack and um, bringing these devices by internal employees inside the corporate network might be something for attackers to, to leverage because these guys know as well that people are returning to the office and I'm very sure it's part of their attack plan. Yeah, absolutely. You know, keep your clean environments clean and safe. Uh, I think that's uh, an attack vector that we've seen in the past attackers have exploited and we'll continue to see in the future. And perhaps a great topic for another FortiGuard Live uh, talk. Uh, so it was always great having you on here and we will see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.